So uh, thank you for the introduction, Dan. Um, I think that pretty much covers my title slide. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to be talking about first uh, my work with Professor Robert Berman, uh, spin pumping in spin torque ferromagnetic resonance. Um, and then I'll be talking with my work with Professor Natasha Holmes, um, analyzing different uh, types of active engagement classrooms um, by using student level variables in linear mixed effects models. And if the title doesn't make sense for now, don't worry, uh, I will go through it all. <laughs> by the end of the talk, we'll know how it, how it, what it means. Um, also, because my talk is so segmented, I'm going to have just a brief time in the middle to make sure we get questions about the first half. And, uh, but also feel free to ask questions during the talk, of course. Um, great. <clears throat> so first, I just want to outline my work um, um, in spintronics. Uh, so first, uh, just discussing a background on spin current generation and detection. Um, so I'll talk about magneto resistance effects and the spin hall effect. Um, then I'm going to talk about magnetization dynamics and the principles behind spin torque ferromagnetic resonance, which is a measurement technique we use to measure spin torques. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about how uh, we can include spin pumping as a contribution to the signal in STFMR. Um, and I'm going to show that it contributes a purely symmetric component to the signal and that it subtracts from the overall signal. Um, and then I'll go over my conclusions. Uh, so first, just very general, what do we mean by spintronics? Uh, so electronics utilize the charge of an electron. That's what you typically think of when you're charging your phone or using your computer. Um, but there's another degree of freedom, which is the electron spin. And so unlike charge, uh, electrons have up or down spin. Um, so basically, if we can utilize both of these degrees of freedom, we're able to do a lot more with manipulating magnetizations, for example. Um, by using charge and spin currents. But how do we detect spin currents and how do we generate them? Um, also, I just realized, yeah, okay, <clears throat> laser pointer. So first I just wanna talk about some magneto resistance effects. Um, these are ways in which you can measure spin-based phenomena sometimes. So for example, anisotropic magneto resistance is when the resistivity or the resistance, the longitudinal resistance, of a ferromagnet can be uh, represented in this way where it depends on the angle of the magnetization with the current direction. Um, so that's what phi is here, that angle between the two. Um, and these different rows, perpendicular and parallel, are when the magnetization is perpendicular or parallel to the current. Um, a much larger magneto resistance effect uh, can happen from giant magneto resistance. So the structure here is uh, we have a uh, ferromagnet, non-magnetic material, and then a ferromagnetic material. And the idea here is that if the two magnetizations are parallel to each other, then the overall resistance through this stack will be lower than if the orientations are anti-parallel. Um, and this can occur because of uh, spin-dependent scattering, and uh, you can think of it maybe in terms of a parallel resistor model. And then there's also uh, tunneling magneto resistance, which can actually be even larger. Um, and it's a very similar setup, except for uh, the, the spacer layer is a uh, electrical insulator. Um, and so typically we'll think about this in terms of the density of states. So there'll be a minority and majority spin subband and uh, the conduction across this interface depends on the relative orientations of the magnetizations. Um, and so these are all kind of different ways we can measure magnetization, uh, it kind of converts these spin-based phenomena into electrical signals, right? Resistance, which we can measure um, pretty easily. Um, but how about, how do we generate a spin current? So uh, there's there's quite a few ways you can generate a spin current, um, but I'm just gonna talk about uh, a particular way in this talk, which would be the spin hall effect. Um, and so if you run a current through um, non-magnetic material, for example, platinum or tungsten, uh, you can get a transverse separation of the spins. So the overall charge current flows through and then we get a transverse separation of a pure spin current. Um, this was kind of first realized actually in ferromagnetic materials. Uh, it's the same effect. It's just that in a ferromagnetic material, you might have, you'll have more of one spin than the other. And thus when you separate the spins, you'll get also a transverse charge uh, current or a voltage, a Hall voltage. And so uh, again, very similar inverse spin hall effect is where if you put a pure spin current into a material, then um, it can have a uh, 
there'll be spin dependent scattering, but this time it'll it'll give you a charge voltage instead of a spin current because we're converting the spin into a charge current. Um, one practical application of this is, uh, for example, magnetic RAM or MRAM. Um, the idea here is that you can read or write states um, using a magnetic tunnel junction. So uh, here we have two magnetic layers and due to tunneling magnetoresistance, uh, we will be able to measure the relative orientation of those magnetizations through a out-of-plane resistance measurement. Um, and then with these samples in particular, although it is possible to switch magnetizations with um, also out-of-plane, you know, larger currents, uh, this is hard on the device. And so the kind of the big idea with this device is that uh, you're able to use spin-orbit torque switching to write. So we will have a uh, charge current flowing in plane and then uh, spin current density flowing out of plane. And that spin current density can impart angular momentum on the uh, free magnetic layer and cause switching. So uh, what are the dynamics behind this switching? I think a big interest is, you know, how does this work? Um, we often model it uh, in this way. So we'll talk about the magnetization processing around an effective field. Um, and so we often model it with the LLGS equation. So here we've uh, modeled with a precession term. Uh, then we also have a, a damping term with a coefficient of alpha. Um, <clears throat> and then we have tor torque terms. And so these torque terms were added later um, to the equation. And the idea behind these torque terms is that we can often talk about two types of torques, a uh, damping-like torque and a field-like torque. And so for an in-plane sample, uh, the damping-like torque will act in-plane and the field-like torque will act out of plane. Um, what this means for our application here is that often it's called the anti-damping-like torque. And so it can actually cause the magnetization to process and flip. Um, so this damping-like torque is, is a term that uh, is of great interest to the field. Um, so here, I just want to point out this term here, the damping-like spin torque efficiency, which is responsible basically for explaining the charge current being converted into a spin current. So if we have a larger efficiency, that means that if we just use a given charge current, we'll get more spin current out of it. Um, now there's a kind of more intrinsic measure of it, which is called the spin hall ratio. Um, and so again, this is just spin current over charge current. The only difference here is we're accounting for this um, interfacial spin transparency. So it's like there's an intrinsic amount of efficiency in the material and then interfaces can cause uh, the damping like spin torque efficiency to be smaller. Um, <clears throat> so uh, what, what is a way we can actually measure this damping like torque? So one way is through a technique known as spin torque ferromagnetic resonance. And this will be uh, the remainder of this talk. Um, so first I, I sputtered um, a non-magnetic layer, um, for example, platinum, four nanometers. And then on top of that, I sputtered a ferromagnetic layer. So that might be from three to 10 nanometers, for example. And the idea behind this measurement is that we flow an RF charge current through the stack. And uh, the charge current that flows through the non-magnetic layer uh, will be converted via the spin hall effect into a transverse uh, spin current. And this can cause precession of the magnetization. Um, and uh, the processing magnetization causes a resistance change due to magnetic resistance effects. And um, and so, yeah, what we'll get out of this is eventually a DC mixing voltage, right? We're running an RF current through this. We have the resistance changing due to magnetic precession, and you end up getting a DC mixing voltage out of it. Uh, exper experimentally speaking, uh, we, just, we use an RF source to run through here. So I fabricated uh, basically uh, bar samples. Um, so these are 20 by 10 micron microstrips. Uh, and using these contact pads, we're able to run the RF current through and then uh, back through, we'll measure the DC voltage using uh, lock-in detection. And the applied field will be 45 degrees to the, we're able to sweep a field 45 degrees to this to get a measurement out. And the mixing voltage that we get from, um, from STFMR is going to be uh, some voltage, which depends on a few parameters, but um, maybe for now it's not too important for the discussion. Uh, and then we have a symmetric and an anti-symmetric component to the signal. The symmetric component is related to the damping-like torque, and the anti-symmetric component is related to these uh, field-like torques. 
So uh, if we, for now, just ignore this field like torque, if we take the ratio of S and A when we do this, when we like do a fit, then we're able to actually get the damping like spin torque efficiency. Um, so again, it's just related to the spin current versus the charge current. <clears throat> and uh, here we have E mu naught and H, which are constants, MS, which is the saturation magnetization. Then we have our two thicknesses. So it depends on the thicknesses of the uh, ferromagnet and non-magnetic layers. And then we have the demagnetization field and the resonant field. So uh, what does it look like in terms of our data? So when we collect a, a field sweep, we would like sweep from zero to 300 or 3000, sorry, or instead, for example. And uh, in the black is our raw data. And we're able to fit this and then extrapolate the components of the signal. So we have a symmetric component highlighted in red. And in the blue here, we have the anti-symmetric component. And so by using those fits and then just you know plugging in the numbers, you're able to get the damping like spin torque efficiency. Um, and so this is an example of a measurement. So I just plotted one point here, uh, damping like spin torque efficiency of minus 0.35, a little bit large. Uh, tungsten is usually around minus 0.3 from the literature and maybe platinum is around 0.1, just to give some numbers for reference. Um, but the problem with this, and this was kind of quickly discovered after um, STFMR had been, been used to figure out these torques, is that if I collect data across different thicknesses, I actually get different measurements of the damping like spin torque efficiency. And this shouldn't really be happening. Um, so what's going on is I obviously ignored the field like torque. And so that's, that's what we need to take into account. So typically what we do is we write this as a spin torque, like an FMR spin torque efficiency, just an overall measure. And we can write it in terms of uh, what we're interested in, which is the damping like spin torque efficiency and the field like spin torque efficiency as such. So if I keep collecting data, uh, I'm zooming out here, um, you get data that looks like this. Um, and so this is happening because the field like torque is, uh, in the samples I'm presenting, it's going to be negative. And so one over one minus something gives you a discontinuity at a certain thickness. And sure enough, we see that at five and a half nanometers of iron cobalt boron, we see this discontinuity. Um, so it's, uh, uh, typically, we'll analyze this by taking the inverses. So we'll plot one over the FMR spin torque efficiency versus one over the thickness, and thus you get a linear function. And the intercept will be related to one over the damping like spin torque efficiency. So I plot one over each versus each other and um, <clears throat> uh, fit. And uh, you can see here that once I do this fit, I'm getting minus 0.23 for the damping spin torque efficiency, and then I've got minus 0.06 for the field like spin torque efficiency. And this is all great. I mean, this is, uh, you know, beautiful theory. Um, you know, it seems to work for a fair number of samples, but then um, there were a lot of cases where this, there were like obvious deviations from this type of behavior. Uh, so for example, I will just show my eight nanometer platinum sample here. So I'm still plotting one over the FMR spin torque efficiency versus one over the thickness here. And this plot should be linear, um, but clearly it's not. And not only that, but it has like another discontinuity, which is very weird. So I'm going to explain uh, how we account for this and actually what can cause this. Um, so one of our idea was that uh, spin pumping can cause this. So um, we have the same setup. But uh, now the processing magnetization actually causes another spin current generation to go down into the non-magnetic layer. And due to the inverse spin Hall effect, this can cause another contribution to the voltage signal. Um, so our mixing voltage now, uh, it turns out that this signal is purely symmetric. So uh, we have S prime now and our A that we had before. And... Um, kind of thinking maybe I should speed up just a little bit for time. So I might kind of gloss over this a little bit, but uh, the, <clears throat> the idea here is that we have like our usual S, but then we're subtracting the signal that we get from spin pumping. And so it relies on some of these parameters, the spin hall ratio. Um, and then we've got like spin diffusion length and G effective. And uh, one of the problems I was fitting using this equation for a while, but um, one of the problems is that it's very difficult to compare to literature or to other measurements because 
um, we don't really know some of these parameters very well, or they're hard to measure. So for example, G effective is difficult to measure, the spin diffusion length difficult to measure, and yeah, even the intrinsic spin hall ratio can be difficult to measure too. So because um, when we write that out, we might be interested in a damping like spin torque efficiency. Now I give a superscript SP for spin pumping here. So I'm I'm distinguishing this part of the signal from the other damping like spin torque efficiency only because I want to distinguish the signal that's coming from this uh, spin current that's going down into the non-magnetic layer. Um, and so because this interfacial spin transparency is also a term that would be difficult to determine, uh, if we assume spin backflow is the only uh, contribution at the interface that causes the interfacial spin transparency, um, like I said, I'll probably just go over this real quick, but we can basically write these parameters in terms of other parameters. And it looks like I'm adding even more variables, but the reality is a lot of these will cancel out and you end up getting uh, something that's just related to this uh, spin pumping, spin torque efficiency, let's call it. And uh, then everything else is kind of known, right? H, E, gamma are all known and rho is resistivity, which we can pretty straightforward measurement. Um, so we can do the same thing. We can define an fMR spin torque efficiency by S prime over A. And what we end up getting is this, which looks like a lot, but I'll break it down. Um, so this is just the conventional SDFMR signal that we had from before. And then all of this is contributions from the spin pumping portion of the signal. Um, so we have like one minus uh, all of this. So if there's no spin pumping, we just get our conventional STFMR signal, which is good. Um, and yeah, again, I might go over this kind of quickly, but I'm just showing the parameters here just to be explicit. Um, but all these parameters, gamma, C1 and C2 are all in terms of parameters that we can either measure or we know um, for the most part. I mean, maybe with the exception of this spin diffusion length hiding inside the tan H term, but that doesn't contribute too much, not like the linear one we had before. Um, so the main thing I want to point out from this is uh, kind of how our spin pumping signal relates to the thicknesses. So I've written out explicitly the thicknesses here, and um, it turns out, so these last two terms you might think blow up uh, when these thicknesses get very small, um, but it turns out that we, we work on the nanometer scale and um, on the nanometer scale, these two thicknesses are typically, or these two terms are typically much smaller than the first two terms. Um, so really what I like to think about is just spin pumping in terms of as we get much thicker, the spin pumping signal is gonna get much stronger, which will subtract from the signal. And so that's how I'm going to plot these and, and demonstrate it. Um, yeah, so how do we actually go about it? So um, like I said, it, it's related to thicker samples. Like if you want to see more more of the spin pumping signal, you make thicker samples. So that's exactly what I did. I sputtered thick platinum. Um, uh, I think Dan has, I think Dan, your microphone is on. Is that right? Sorry. Oh, no worries. Um, uh, where was I? Oh, so... Uh, uh, the thicker, yeah, I sputtered like thick platinum and then uh, thick iron cobalt boron on top. Um, here I've inserted a half neem spacer layer and this has been shown to suppress the field like torque. Um, there we go. Uh, so I'll, I'll claim for now that the sample doesn't have a field like torque just to simplify our equations, um, but I'll demonstrate that in a moment. So this is what our data looks like. So without a field like torque, what we would expect would be just a flat line, right? We would have you know, just damping like spin torque efficiency constant. Um, but what we actually see is um, this signal decreasing as a function of thickness. And again, I argue that this is largely due to spin pumping. Um, so here I will just demonstrate if we do our standard fit, even with a field like torque, uh, this um, at least qualitatively does not, <laughs> does not work. Um, and if we do the fit even without spin pumping, um, but with, or sorry, without a field like torque, but with spin pumping, uh, then we get a, a pretty good fit to the data. So it seems to fit well, and we get a damping like torque of 4.5% here. And then from the spin pumping signal, we're estimating that it's about 13%, uh, which is a little bit larger. Um, I think I'm just going to ignore, we also did it with all the terms, but I think I won't um, discuss that too much right now. 
So I did this for a bunch of platinum samples. So I, I repeated this uh, for four, six, and eight nanometers of platinum. And as you can see, four nanometers is on top here, then six, and then eight. So also with the uh, non-magnetic layer thickness, the signal is decreasing. And uh, we actually see that the fMR signal is going below zero uh, for a lot of these data points. And that's not possible in conventional STFMR uh, if you have a positive damping like torque and a field like torque. Um, <clears throat> and so, yep, we fit all of these. And uh, essentially what I want to show is from the spin pumping signal, we estimate the damping like torque to be uh, for the four nanometer sample, 13%, like I showed before, and then 20% for both the six and the eight nanometer samples. Um, but something that was a little problematic is that, well, our estimate of the damping like torque uh, from the conventional portion of the signal, I guess, is uh, decreasing quite dramatically over, across the thicknesses. And so, you know, I put a question mark here, right? It seems like our spin pumping signal is able to give us some reasonable results, especially for the thicker samples where spin pumping is a large component of the signal, we're able to fit it. Um, so this is why I ended up trying out uh, platinum tantalum samples. So I introduced some tantalum into the system and this gives us a higher resistivity, which is gonna give us a larger damping like spin torque efficiency. So we'll get stronger signals there. Um, but not only that is also the resistivity is a lot more consistent. So the resistivity between the different thicknesses of platinum changes quite a bit. Um, you know, between four, six, and eight nanometers, it changes um, almost by a factor of two, I think. But in our platinum tantalum samples, we found that the resistivity was not changing much between the thicknesses. Um, so repeating again, but now with platinum tantalum, uh, we get these three plots, similar story uh, in terms of decreasing with both thicknesses. And when we fit it, uh, now we're getting more consistent numbers. So the damping like spin torque efficiency measured from the conventional part of the signal is about nine, eight or 7%, depending on the sample. So maybe still some variation here, but definitely not as much as the platinum samples. Um, and then from the spin pumping portion of the signal, we also have a little variation, but, um, for the most part, for the thicker samples where the spin pumping signal is stronger, we have maybe, uh, 20 to 27%. Um, <clears throat> and so just to kind of um, finish this up, so we have, uh, if I remove the half neum spacer layer, so now I'm including a field like torque, uh, you can still see the field like torque contribution. So remember that the field like torque would cause a discontinuity if you plot things linearly. So linear and spin torque, um, the fMR spin torque efficiency and the thickness. And so as we go down in thickness, uh, we can see that we get quite a large uh, field like torque contribution in the four nanometer sample. Um, and so I guess what I wanted to demonstrate here is how dependent these fits are on the dominating signal. So for our four nanometer sample, we can see about 10% for the damping like spin torque efficiency. And then the field like was about minus 0.04%, let's say. Um, but this, this signal from the um, spin pumping part of the signal um, was basically a really bad fit. It was, we said minus 0.15 and the error bars were like 0.25. So um, it was really for the thicker samples that we got uh, more consistent numbers for these spin pumping uh, contributions to the signal. Um, but the other numbers are all consistent. And I think that part of the story here is uh, just that, you know, we've got a lot of different signals happening. So we have field like torques as well as you know, this spin pumping portion of the signal that we're using a fitting parameter for. Um, and so because of that, in order to really get a good estimate from spin pumping, you have to make sure spin pumping is a, a dominant part of the signal. Um, so those are our estimates from, from this. Um, and so, yeah, basically, I, uh, I think that's really the main things I wanted to show from, from this research. So uh, I think the summary here is that we observe phenomena that's not explained by conventional STFMR. Um, when the field like torque is zero, we observe uh, that the fMR spin torque efficiency changes as a function of thickness. Um, and when the field like torque is greater than zero, we're seeing that one over these plotted versus against each other is nonlinear. Um, and so both of these are only explained by some other artifacts to the voltage. Uh, using spin pumping model, uh, qualitatively, the fits match very well. Um, and we match, we get values of the damping like torque from spin pumping, um, similar to those from harmonic hall measurements. 
but there's still a discrepancy between our two fitting parameters, which is not necessarily what we would expect. We expect these two fitting parameters to give us the same information. Um, so I think, yeah, so it's possible for future experiments to investigate these alternate sources to the signal. Um, there's certainly still more going on here. Um, and I wanted to just, yeah, take a pause here for any questions that people have. So usually we let uh, non-committee members ask questions first. So maybe before I, I have one, but I'll see if there are any of those first. Got it. I have some very naive questions coming from the land of theoretical physics where everything is comparatively perfect. <laughs> yep. um, so so uh, can, I, I have no sense for, you know, given that you do these different measurements, they don't generally seem to overlap in their errors at the different thicknesses. Is this sort of expected or, or what is, how should I interpret that? Other than those the experiments are super challenging and it's real world. Yeah, I mean, no, that's a great question. I mean, that's that's the type of question that should be asked, right? It's, uh, um, maybe I'll go back to this one, which I claim to be a consistent sample, but still shows, right? There's still differences in these measurements between the different thicknesses. Um, so yeah, there's a lot going on here. Uh, one effect, for example, is, well, as I mentioned, changing resistivity can just yield different intrinsic uh, spin torque efficiencies in the sample. So it's almost like, it's almost like you wouldn't expect different thicknesses to necessarily have the same number because um, just by changing the thickness, you can be changing the spin torque efficiency. Um, now, I don't think that's necessarily the case here. So I think some of these discrepancies are coming from what you said too, is that, um, you know, these, these experiments are very challenging and, and there's probably something else going on here in addition to the spin pumping signal. Um, so that, that's kind of our idea for now. I think we can largely account for like these discrepancies in the data by spin pumping, but I also think there's, um, there's still these discrepancies and, and it's not necessarily what we would expect. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, no sort of a re related effect. Like, uh, it seems th these are very uh, thin thicknesses, and this sort of a thing, sort of again coming from uh, the land of not knowing anything about it. How difficult is it to sort of determine, or how do you, while, while you're making the sample, be like, oh, this is going to be four nanometers, and sort of you give like a two sentence summary of what this process looks like because it just is mind yeah. to me. No, that's also a great question. Yeah, so um, so we sputter the samples. So there's a whole mechanism of sputtering, which um, I guess the super quick explanation would be that we calibrate the rates at which we sputter. Um, so we know like how long it takes to sputter one nanometer. And usually these time scales um, for like platinum might be like, you know, a minute or two per nanometer. Um, so, you know, if you sputter for like eight minutes, you've sputtered four nanometers, something like that. Um, so that, that's basically how we do it. We, we calibrate using other samples and we measure those thicknesses. Like we measure them using profilometry. Um, so yeah, uh, basically we, we sputter much thicker than this to get the calibration. And then we assume these thicknesses from calibration. Okay. That's super helpful. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. Any other questions? So, so I'll ask mine, uh, which is I'm wondering how much sample to sample variation do you have in nominally identical devices? Have you know? Oh yeah, like if I mul if I measure multiple devices. Yeah, yeah, um, that have nominally they're the same geometry, but uh, you know. <laughs> yeah, like we expect them to be identical. Um, um, that's a that's a really good question. Usually, it can depend a bit on the material, actually. Um, but for like platinum samples, for example, the variation maybe wouldn't be too much. You know, maybe if I estimated the damping like spin torque efficiency to be 10%, um, maybe I would expect for the same exact devices to be plus or minus 1% or less. Um, yeah, even just re-measuring the same exact device, you can still sometimes get a little bit of difference too. Um, I've been very consistent about, um, those measurements. So I think those are basically a wash, but... But yeah, between devices, there can still be some variation. Um, yeah. Okay, thanks. 
Yeah, and actually there's something related, but when I measured this sample, uh, I said it should be linear, and uh, there's actually, you'll see some nonlinearity here, but you'll see that my, my fit with the data points fits very nicely. Um, so actually I've accounted for another effect here, which is that even across the wafer, uh, the thickness is vary a little bit, even due to sputtering. Um, so these deviations off of the line are actually expected based on the thicknesses that I measured from calibrating basically the entire wafer. Um, so yeah, even on one wafer, the thicknesses can vary, yeah. Um, I actually had a similar question to Eric's, just, just for my own benefit. I, I know you've taken a huge amount of data, um, so I'll, I'll try to get a few other things out of your brain. Um, yeah. How important is frequency? Do, do things vary all that much with frequency, and does spin pumping generally account for the frequency dependence, or are there other things that we're leaving out of the model for that, too? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. Um, off the top of my head, I'm trying to remember how things vary in frequency. I know I did have some samples in the past that had a lot of frequency dependence. I don't think I saw it too much in these samples. Um, I am trying to think about how that might impact the spin pumping portion of the signal. Um, yeah, I guess the way I've modeled it, I'm saying that we've accounted for the frequency dependence and that's, you know, that's how we're modeling like these, uh, field sweeps, but but in practice, I, I do see sometimes a little bit of frequency dependence. Um, I don't know if that fully answers your question, but... Um, well, we go ahead. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? Hi, Rohan. Uh, what was Hi. the resistivity uh, for platinum 90% tantalum, 10% uh, uh, devices for defined thickness? Yeah. Um, so we typically had around uh, 75 microohm centimeters for the platinum tantalum samples. Um, for the thinnest one, I think it was a little bit higher. It was like closer to 90, but yeah, variation was a lot less. Whereas for platinum, we had like 50 microohm centimeters versus like 25, excuse me, 25 microohm centimeters for uh, eight and four nanometers, or sorry, four and eight nanometers. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, if there are no question, no more questions, then I'll probably just move on. Um, and Dan, I think you're, yep, there we go. Um, <clears throat> oh, sorry, I just saw your message. Um, okay, so yeah, the next part of my talk is going to be, uh, we're going to be looking at active engagement uh, classes, so uh, and analyzing this using linear mixed models. So first, uh, first, my clicker decided to stop working. There we go. So first, I want to give an introduction to modern physics education research um, and define active learning. And then I want to talk about linear mixed effects modeling, which is going to be the method, the statistical method we're going to use to analyze the data. Uh, and then I'm going to show our results, uh, comparing the two styles of active instruction. Um, I'll try to go through some of this a little bit quick, just so that we have more time to talk about the results. Yeah, you're doing okay on time, Ryan. You don't need to rush. Okay. All right. Uh, so anyway, in early PER, um, this is well, at least this is kind of a big shift in the thought process behind PER in the 1980s, um, which is that learning becomes a process in which new concepts must displace or be remolded from stable concepts that the student has constructed over many years. And uh, the idea here is that misconceptions in physics are robust and stable, not easily replaced by new information. And this, this was a huge shift. I mean, this, thinking about it in terms of, um, you know, I think, I think there was a, a, a lot of belief that students come to class as a blank slate and then they soak up your information like a sponge, you know, um, but that's actually not what's happening, right? Students have preconceptions about the material, right? Before they've even learned it, you know, they have experiences from life and um, especially for like the classic example is Newtonian mechanics where students have experienced, you know, what a ball being thrown looks like or something like that. And so they have their own ideas that they're coming in with. So when you present these ideas to them, they have to reconcile the differences between what you're teaching them and what they've experienced. Um, 
can sort of internalize all of it. So there's three main theoretical frameworks between these things. So first was the misconceptions framework, which is what I kind of mentioned before, you know, difficult to change your preconceptions. Then there's the knowledge and pieces uh, framework, which is that students have bits and pieces of knowledge that when they're presented with a question or a problem, they assemble the knowledge on the fly. Um, and then ontological categories, which is uh, about how the misconceptions are due to categorizations of their knowledge. And then there's a kind of more modern version of knowledge and pieces, which is the resources view, um, which is that the knowledge is applied in different contexts. So I think the main thing there is just the knowledge and pieces is very contextual, it depends on the question or context. And so just in general, understanding how students uh, learn helps both students and teachers. And I think this is a big driving force for PER. Um, so now I want to define active learning, right? So um, uh, I really like this quote. It involves students in doing things and thinking about the things they are doing. And if that sounds very general, then that's the point. Uh, I think that active learning is a very broad term for a bunch of different practices that you can implement in your classrooms. And um, and I think this just gets you to think about it in terms of, of that breadth, how broad it is. Um, and so a traditional classroom for would be maybe students take notes during class, uh, students apply the material and do homework after class, and then after some time they get feedback on their graded homework. An active classroom, uh, some of the implementations you can use, um, for example, you might use eye clickers during class or learning catalytics response systems. Um, this is even like just having students give a thumbs up or thumbs down can count. Um, the main difference being that like if you just have students asking questions during class, then there's only a few students that might ask questions. And those are the only ones that are really going to be actively engaging um, necessarily. But anyway, interactive demonstrations uh, goes along kind of with the response systems. Uh, think, pair, share, where students uh, kind of think about a question and then themselves and then they share their ideas with their neighbor, for example. And then there's a specific implementation of active learning called flipping the classroom, um, which is where students do material before the lecture and then during lecture they really emphasize still some of these active learning principles. Um, oops. And so often, uh, you know, an active classroom in general is really all about immediate feedback, right? Students are able to uh, demonstrate and give their ideas with immediate feedback um, without having to, you know, wait until after the lecture or, you know, be confused during the lecture. Um, so motivation uh, for this subject is that active learning classrooms consistently outperform traditional classrooms. Uh, and this study <clears throat> um, in 2014 was, was a big deal because um, they did a meta-analysis of over 200 other studies and uh, showed that um, basically the, the failure rate of uh, students was extremely different between active learning and traditional classrooms. So, in this plot on the left here, um, we're seeing a decreased failure rate to the right, um, and then uh, increased failure rate to the left. And very few studies had active learning classrooms that had an increased failure rate. Vast majority of them, and even some of them very large, uh, decreased failure rates. Um, and similar plot here, um, just showing that the active instruction in the blue curve um, had a much lower percentage of students who failed a class than uh traditional lecture uh, style classrooms and so the question then is well how do active learning classrooms compare to each other um this was kind of the question that that we pose um so not a lot of studies have actually looked at uh active learning classrooms compared to each other so this was sort of something that we really wanted to look at and it was very unclear actually how what we should expect um so our research questions are, are there performance differences between two distinct types of learning, active learning instruction styles? If so, are the differences related to instruction style focus and type of assessment? Um, and then our second question is, how is the performance from different demographics of students affected by instruction style? Uh, so basically our first question, just saying, is there a difference? And then um, the second question specifically about, um, you know, there's been reported uh, performance gaps, uh, for example, for gender, um, you know, men have scored um, on conceptual inventories, it's been reported that they often score higher than women uh, statistically on the, uh, yeah, on the concept inventories. Um, and so, although we can't really address maybe a lot of the underlying questions behind those types of things, we did want to see how instruction style might affect the gaps. Um, 
And so now I just kind of want to take a quick, before we all dive into it, is uh, ethics and interpretations of the data. Uh, so there's a lot of ethical, you know, issues with obviously studying humans in general. Um, and so uh, controls in these studies are extremely difficult. Now, obviously, like you might immediately think of like a lot of reasons why that might be the case, but um, it can even be fairly subtle. So one subtle point that I like to emphasize is that we cannot knowingly compromise education for research purposes. Um, and what I mean by that is like, if I wanna study a bunch of active learning classrooms, because it's been so well documented and shown that traditional classrooms um, underperform compared to active classrooms, uh, we can't just make a bunch of traditional classrooms and say, okay, there's our control group because we're compromising their education. Um, so this is a, one of the big deals among many other ethical concerns. Um, but the long story short is that our data is gonna be very messy. Um, I mean, it's dealing with humans is generally messy too. And so we need to do statistical analysis to answer our questions. And I wanna also just make sure we all keep in mind correlation, not causation. I know many, many of you have heard that before, but um, you know, internalizing it and reminding yourself of it while you see statistical data is really important. Um, it's very easy to slip into the causality mindset. Humans just like to do that. Um, okay, so for our experimental design, we had a e &M course for STEM majors, uh, 14 semesters starting from fall 2012. And Cornell flipped the classroom starting in spring 2015 as part of the active learning initiative. So our learning outcomes were measured in two ways. Uh, first was we had the conceptual survey of electricity and magnetism. This is a 32 question multiple choice test um, that covers concepts. Um, there's no calculations necessarily needed to, to do the test. And then there's final course grades. Um, so finally, the instruction style was determined by interviews with professors using the teaching practices inventory. So basically determining what style of classrooms everybody was teaching with. And so we found that there were three main types in our data set. Um, so the first was the traditional lecture. Um, I've talked about it already, but basically just taking notes during class, doing homework after class. Then we have the, uh, what we called the conceptual active learning class. We'll just call it A1. Um, and so it's still before lecture is just suggested reading. That's not graded. Um, but during the class, there was a big emphasis on demonstrations, uh, using the clicker response system and using think pair share techniques. Um, so just basically during the lecture was very active. And then uh, our second uh, style of active learning classroom was after what, what we consider the flip of the classroom. So before the class, students would do pre-lecture videos and pre-lecture activities, which were graded. And by the way, if you ever flip the classroom, it's important that it's graded. If you don't grade it, then it actually doesn't have the benefit. Um, so then uh, for during the lecture, uh, then we had demonstrations and they use learning catalytics so they could actually work out um, more involved problems. So a lot of this class involved uh, more calculation heavy problems during lecture. And that's why I called it uh, problem solving active learning <clears throat> and then still homework and discussions afterwards. Um, so now in order to analyze this data, I'm going to use li linear mixed effects modeling. And I wanted to just talk about why I'm doing that. Uh, so the data is multi-level or hierarchical. And so um, this is a great plot by um, uh, Jason Nissen and um, Ben Van Dissen. And here on the left, we have just an example data set um, where we have a bunch of courses. So like one, two, three, four, five. And within each of those courses, students have different SAT verbal scores. And we're going to use those SAT verbal scores to be predicting their FCI. Um, that's force concept inventory. It's another conceptual inventory uh, post-test score. And so um, one way to view the data is called disaggregation. And this is actually a very common way to think about it. You know, it's like, okay, I've collected data on 3,000 students, and I just want to see the relationship between SAT verbal score and FCI post-test score. So you take your 3,000 students, and you make a plot of all the data points, and then you draw a line through it, and you say, there's the trend. Um, and in this case, you would see a negative correlation between SAT verbal score and FCI post-test score, which is very unusual. Um, there's another method known as aggregation, which is a similar thing. It's just saying, okay, well, we had five courses. How did they all do? And what was their relationship? So each of the courses had a different mean verbal score, mean SAT verbal score, and 
um, their FCI post-test scores are here. And so you get also a very uh, strong negative correlation. Um, so this is what linear mixed effects models are for. It's handling this multi-level data to um, you know, address those kind of discrepancies. So basically we're saying, okay, well, clearly you know, within each course, right? There might be differences between the courses, but within each course, uh, there was a very strong positive correlation between SAT verbal scores. Um, and then of course, between courses was the strong negative correlation. So maybe there's an effect happening on the course level. Um, but um, let's see, what did I wanna say about that? I guess, well, I guess that's it really. Just, yeah, we have to handle it in a multi-level way. Um, so how do we do it? Um, so first we're basically starting with uh, what looks like ordinary least squares regression. Um, so what we're going to have here is, uh, I guess, um, for completeness, uh, I is a student and J is the course or semester that we're going to deal with in our study. Um, so this is the outcome variable. So this would be something like the CSEM score or the final grades. Um, then we have student level predictor variables. And so these would be the pretest score, for example, this test they took before the class, uh, SAT score, et cetera. And um, yeah, these are random errors for each student in a course. And so these coefficients beta are um, kind of what we're interested in because, for example, if beta is very large for like pretest score, that means that, oh, pretest score is a very strong predictor of post-test score. And here's how it would predict post-test score. Um, so yeah, again, beta is our student level regression coefficients. Um, I think maybe just the main, so, you know, we have like course level regression coefficients here and the course level predictor variable. So like, G would be like, what courses do you have, for example? In our case, we only have like one of these extra variables because it's just like, we're just using semester, um, but this, it's known as a random effect. So these, these U's at the end here are the random effects, which are adjusted for those course level variables on those regression coefficients in our first equation. Um, and so the way to think about this, I think is, well, first, what do I even mean by random effect? So maybe one semester, I'm just gonna give like a arbitrary example, but one semester maybe had a fire alarm go off during like an important concept, for example. And so like that was shown statistically in their CSEM scores. Um, but like the reason for that course not doing as well was not because of instruction style, it was just because of like literally a random effect. Um, and so like, yeah, maybe we can account for a fire alarm, for example, but, um, but you know, we don't know everything. And that's the idea is like, we can't know everything about these courses. And so there are random effects that cause these courses to perform differently than each other. And we have to account for that. Um, so, but the main thing to look at here, I think is just this first equation. And just to understand that these student level predictor variables are going to be, um, uh, they're gonna have these regression coefficients and the regression coefficients are what we're interested in. Um, <clears throat> so, oh, and that's what makes it a mixed effects model too. Um, so just as an example, SAT scores predicting the FCI post-test scores again, uh, if beta one equals zero, then that means that SAT scores are not influencing the prediction. And if beta one, for example, is greater than zero, then an increase in their SAT scores predicts an increase in their CSEM post-test scores. So these betas are, are really what we're going to be interested in. That's what I'm going to be plotting for the um, remainder of the talk, basically. So what is our model? Um, very quickly, I'm going to go through it, but we have CSEM post-test score and final grades as our outcome variables. So that means two separate models already. Um, then we have student level variables. So we have CSEM pretest score, uh, class standing, which we're going to treat as binary first year and beyond first year. Season, uh, fall versus spring. You might be wondering why I'm including season. Uh, long story short, fall semesters perform very differently than spring semesters. Um, from a statistics standpoint, we include it. ACT, SAT math scores, AP test scores, which we treated as high score, low score, or didn't take. Um, gender, which was treated as binary, male or female. Um, we are also aware that not everyone aligns with binary gender, but um, but for the purposes of what we, the information we got from the registrar and uh, for this study, we treat it as binary variable. Uh, URM status, so underrepresented minority, binary variable, and first generation student status. Um, and of course, last but not least, I have to include, of course, the classroom instruction type, right? That's what we're looking at. Um, so we're going to look at traditional versus active versus active uh, for our first set here, but then I'm going to just talk about active versus active. 
Um, <clears throat> just some quick raw statistics and kind of emphasize the point of why we're using these models. Uh, traditional class had 57% on post-test versus about 60% on the active learning classrooms. Um, final grade was 2.9% versus 3.06, 3.18. Um, so if, if you just looked at this data, uh, you might expect that, well, the traditional class, and you know, it's by more than a couple of standard deviations, traditional class performed worse. Um, but what I didn't show you is the pretest scores. Uh, so the pretest scores are also have this gap. So like the traditional classroom had 37% uh, versus 40 and 42%. Um, and so then you have to ask yourself, okay, well, did the traditional classroom type perform worse, or is it explained by pretest score? Um, and so I want to introduce how we, how I'm going to present these models with this example. Um, so the effects are on the left. So these would be like the, um, the student level variables that you put into the model. Uh, and then um, these two columns here on the right are two separate models, one for predicting post-test scores and one for predicting final grades. Um, and so the numbers in the table here are the value of those those betas, those uh, regression coefficients that we find from fitting. And so here we see pretest score uh, 0 0.54, 0 0.343, and they're both highly statistically significant, um, which makes sense. CSEM, CSEM pretest score is really good at predicting CSEM post-test score. Um, and so here we're also, I wanna mention, we're using the traditional class as the base. So I show two class types here, A1 and A2, um, and we're comparing to traditional. Uh, CSEM pretest was the strongest predictor, which is expected. Um, the traditional class performed worse in final grades um, on both, uh, both compared to A1 and A2 class types, um, but it was statistically significant for the A2 class type. Um, but maybe the CSEM score wasn't as significant. Um, and one thing I really want to point out here, like this number is actually pretty big, like 0.3 is a very big uh, predictor. You can see the other 0.3 variable here was uh, highly statistically significant, but this one like barely got statistical significance. The reason for that is statistical power is low because we only have one traditional class. Remember, we're taking into account these random effects from different courses. And so because we only have one traditional class, um, yeah, there's just not as much statistical power as we can get from that. So for the rest of this analysis, I'm gonna bombard you with another table. Uh, but now we're just comparing A1 versus A2 class types. We're gonna ignore the traditional instruction now. Um, <clears throat> and just look at this. Yeah. So again, um, you know, pretest score was highly significant. Um, and then here we have class type A2. And as we can see, there is no statistically significant difference that we found between the A1 and A2 class types, um, both measured by CSEM post-test score and final grade. And actually, that's pretty interesting because um, we had two measures of this. And uh, the fact that these two very distinct implementations of active learning have similar performance regardless of learning outcome measure uh, means a lot, I think. Um, so that, that was kind of the main result of our study. Um, now there are some like miscellaneous things that we saw. So uh, first of all, just pointing out season is not statistically significant. I guess as we expected, you know, fall versus spring, once you account for everything else, uh, it's it's not actually a real, you know, effect. It's It's just different semesters had different demographics of students. Um, class standing was though highly significant. Um, and at first you're like uh, thinking this is very interesting because we have um, freshmen like well outperforming uh, beyond first year students. And, uh, but then maybe you think about the fact that well, most freshmen taking this class must have had college credit coming into it. Um, and that's because this is a second semester course. So, but then uh, then you come back to being surprised by it. So I'm surprised by it. And the reason is because I've accounted for a lot of these like incoming college credits and like preparatory variables. So even accounting for these things, there's still something about, um, you know, these, these first year students are correlated with uh, uh, higher scores. And it could just, it's probably just more preparatory variables that I haven't accounted for um, just being contained within this variable. Uh, AP scores were very different, and uh, I'm not going to go through them all, but the, the long story short is that not taking the AP test um, had higher predictive scores than taking the test, but scoring lower. Um, and so I think that's very interesting. Um, and actually, this is definitely worth more study because this was like highly significant. In fact, the strongest predictor for final grade was not CSEM pretest score. It was 
if you took the BC calculus test and scored below a four, that was the strongest predictor of your final grade. Um, so that was uh, very surprising, and I really didn't expect that. And it's such it's had such high statistical significance that I think it'd be really worth another study. Um, so uh, we answered the first research question, and the second one was, um, you know, how is performance from different demographics of students affected by instruction style? Um, going to kind of go quickly through it too, but. Basically, first, I just go back to the table and show what performance gaps did we see. So we did see a performance gap for gender and first generation students on the CSEM post test score. And we did see performance gaps for um, underrepresented minorities and first generation students on the final exam. Um, so yeah, what about our second research question, though? It's about how these are affected by instruction style. And in order to actually test that, we need more models. Uh, so we, we're going to use new models with interaction terms. And I am going to spare you the monster tables that are involved with this and just give you some pictures. Um, so here we have a predicted CSEM post-test score on the y-axis on the top. And on the bottom, we have predicted final grades. Um, and this on the x-axis is just the class type, so like A1 versus A2. And so the idea is that like we're able to look at how each of these variables are changing in the predictions based on class type. Um, so for one example here, um, gender, for example, we had a uh, male in the light blue um, with a slight decrease in uh, predicted CSUM score uh, based on class type. And then we see a similar trend for um, the female students. So um, these gaps. So, you know, I, I guess the idea here is that it wasn't statistically significant and we're not really seeing like a huge effect on the performance gap based on the instruction style. Um, although there might be a little bit of something here, but it's, it's, it didn't turn out to be statistically significant. So for the most part, interaction terms were not significant, um, but I will point out a couple that were. Um, so the, the one that's most relevant for our study was that uh, URM students may have had a difference on CSUM scores with A1 favored over A2. Um, so that's in this plot here, and you can see that uh, URM students maybe had a, a, a sharper slope here than the um, uh, non-URM students. And yeah, I don't know if we have any, you know, I think we can't really say anything other than we observed it, but um, but yeah, and it, it's not like super statistically significant either, but otherwise most of these interaction terms were not statistically significant. Um, and I, I think that's one of the main things that we observed is just that. Um, and we had season and first year significance here. And this is a really weird one. Um, these were very, these were like very significant. And you can see the slopes are like one's positive, one's negative. So it's like fall strongly benefited from A2 class type. Um, but then it's also like the first year students had like kind of an opposite effect. And there are a lot more first year students in spring semesters. So there's also some correlation stuff that can be happening there too. Um, I'm not 100% sure, but I still think we sh should have been able to count that in our model, but anyway, this is what we observe. Um, so just to conclude, uh, so using linear mixed models, we're, uh, we observe no statistically significant difference between A1 and A2 class types. Um, and this is actually a similar finding. So there was a study I found in biology education research um, in 2015 that showed a flipped classroom having a very similar learning outcome to uh, general active learning classrooms. Um, and then by using linear mixed models with interaction terms, we found most performance gaps were not correlated to class type. Um, but there was some indication that URM student performance may be slightly correlated. So that's interesting and maybe worth future investigation. Um, some of our miscellaneous findings, such as effects from AP test variables, are, I think, definitely worth future investigation. I mean, these, these were such strong predictors, but because they're not part of our study, it's not really like questions we were answering. They're just like, you know, if we, if we had like a list of a thousand variables, we'd expect some of them to be significant. So that's kind of the idea here is because it wasn't our original research question, it's not really something we can comment on. Future work can isolate and address more specific active learning practices to observe these effects. Um, so this is the part of the talk where um, I give acknowledgments. <laughs> and uh, I guess first and foremost, I want to acknowledge um, Professor Robert Berman, who is my advisor. Um, uh, I've learned a lot from him, um, not just in terms of physics, but also in terms of life in general. And, um, you know, he's always been very straightforward and I've really appreciated that. And, um, you know, the way he's run his research group too, he really allows students to work on um, projects that they're passionate about. And I think it's resulted in really fantastic research. Um, 
unfortunately, uh, for those who don't know, Bob passed away earlier this year um, in April. And so I just wanted to give a one minute uh, moment of silence for uh, Bob. And, uh, you know, if you know him to reflect on it, and uh, if you don't, just to respectfully join us in a moment of silence. So I'll do a one minute moment of silence now. <clears throat> Uh, thank you for joining me in a moment of silence there. <clears throat> um, uh, I guess <laughs> more acknowledgements. Uh, so, of course, Professor Dan Ruff, Professor Natasha Holmes, and Professor Eric Mueller for being on my committee. Um, you know, obviously, I did a lot of work with Natasha um, on the education research. And uh, Eric also actually helped with that, too. He um, uh, collected some of this CSEM data and uh, helped us with that. And uh, Dan Ralph, of course, for um, you know stepping up, being my advisor now, and helping me finish all of this and my thesis. Um, so thank you so much, Dan. Uh, really, this would not have happened without you. So thank you, um, and just thank you to all the group members. I know I haven't listed everyone here, but um, I'll particularly point out uh, Youngshi, for example. He, uh, you know, I worked with him just before he graduated, and so um, you know that's where kind of the spin pumping project came from, uh, and then. Uh, I guess Emily Cole and Martin for, you know, sharing an office together and just, you know, learning so much from each other and Cole being the master of statistics and teaching me so much, much about that. Um, so anyway, thank you so much for your attention and I will be happy to take questions. Uh, I had a question. Um, yeah. So at Cornell, I've seen, and I think you mentioned in the talk that with active learning, um, we use like learning catalytics or um, eye clickers. Uh, mm -hmm. I was wondering in regions where there may not be enough funding and infrastructure, would these active learning techniques, like would active learning work? Are there other techniques to do it without needing this infrastructure? Yeah, definitely. Like active learning. So yeah, there's a couple aspects to your question, actually. Uh, so one aspect is, can you do it without basically technology? And absolutely you can. Uh, you can still do response systems in, in some ways. Um, you can have students give like thumbs ups or thumbs downs. The idea behind it is really just, you need to make sure that um, like all of the students are thinking about the problem and giving some type of feedback, right? They're, you know, you don't want just like only a couple students raising their hand to ask questions. Um, so, you know, technology has helped us to be able to do that very efficiently and in more sophisticated ways, um, but you can still do it without technology. Um, and then also, generally speaking, uh, I think a big reason why education research is uh, always going to be moving forward is because education always changes with technology, too. So, um, yeah, you know, it's it, active learning is a very broad term and, um, yeah, getting creative with how you, uh, how you implement it uh, is important, yeah, with the resources that you have. Thank you. Yeah. Um, does anyone else have any questions? Uh, so I'm, you know, I, I think you did an excellent job of digging into that data that we have collected from that, the, the flipping of 2213. I think that was a really important thing to do. And it's, it's really great that you did that. Uh, do you see more things which need to be done with that data or more things that can be done with that data? That's a really good question. Um, yeah, it's hard to say. I mean, so, you know, part of the issue is, um, you know, you can only, it's, it's, 
uh, it's almost like a quantum mechanics effect where like if you measure the, the data and then decide to ask more questions after, suddenly you can't do that. Um, so it's like, because I've done this analysis, um, I've really restricted the number of research questions that we can ask about that data now in a weird way because we know. So it's like, you know, now that I've shown, oh, AP test scores were highly significant, we can't approach the data again and say, using the same data set, let's see if AP test scores are significant, um, which would be like a separate research question. So it is, yeah, it's a little bit of a paradox, I guess. Um, but I'm, sh I feel like it's such a large data set that there are other questions that I would like to see answered. Um, for example, if there was, you know, if there was data, it, it depends on what's maybe been collected, but like if there was data on like other random stuff like uh students who sat together or like uh you know like positions in the lecture room or like maybe the lecture times which i actually think we do have a record of i just didn't take a look at it um and so those types of questions are actually still hiding in the data um but i've definitely restricted the amount of questions we can ask right or i guess you know there's similar data with with uh some of the other courses 11 12 for example yeah so you could you could ask the the uh ap question for it yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So like if as long as you have a different data set, you know, then we can ask these questions again. Yeah. Hi, Ryan. I have a question. Yep. Yeah. Thank you for the great job. Uh, I know that, you know, across the literature, we, we see that the you have added in addition to the other great findings from your research, you have also added to the, to the weight of the evidence in terms of uh, the URM, for example. So we, this gap, you know, no matter how small it is, it remains you know, persistent. Uh, yeah. So what do you think like from in terms of maybe uh, in addition to what you have done, what do you think we can query in terms of trying to understand why this gap remains, you know, uh, remains even with all of the the efforts in terms of active learning strategies and the opportunities to try to make things better. Yeah, no, I mean that's such a good question, and um, yeah, it's always hard to answer because like it's so natural for us to ask the why question, right? Like we we see the performance gap, so naturally we we want to know why. Um, and yeah, it's just, it's such an enormous question, I think, that um, it will have to span even multiple fields. You know, there's education research, but then there's also like, you know, fields of psychology and sociology and all of these different things. Um, I think something I would be personally very interested in, um, because we didn't have this data, but I would be very interested in seeing it, would be uh, socioeconomic status. Um, so, you know, I, I could very easily see socioeconomic status being related to um, or being a predictor variable of uh, these outcome variables that we measured. Um, so I think that would be a good next step as well. Um, yeah, in terms of the URM, yeah, I guess there, there haven't been actually a lot of reports in the literature about it, like you said. Um, and so I think, yeah, also just acknowledging it and uh, and doing more research to investigate that in general is good. But yeah, I think I, I would be very interested in um, seeing like socioeconomic status too. Um, that was a variable that we didn't include and I, I wish I could. Um, yeah. I don't know if I helped answer that question, but <laughs> hopefully, hopefully a little bit. Any remaining questions? I've got a bunch of questions, but I'll save them for the next part. <laughs> oh, okay, fair enough. Yeah, if there are no other questions, um, I want to I want to thank Ryan, um, and people can give him at least a virtual virtual applause, I guess. Um, <laughs> And uh, at this stage, we will um, sort of reserve things just to the committee members uh, uh, for a few more detailed questions. Um, uh, so if the other, if, if everyone else could sign off, that would be a good thing.